Hey, this is Chris, Keeping It Real. Got a mobile book review for you. Gone for Soldiers by Jeff Sherr. It's about, it's a novel that takes place during the Mexican War. I call it the Mexican-American War. He seems, seems to be calling it just the Mexican War. I don't think it matters. Uh, <clears throat> it is, now to me, the Mexican Wars, and of course I'm not well read on the subject, which is why this book was so enjoyable, but I kind of lump in the war for Texas independence and, and any subsequent military action as the Mexican-American War. Now, <clears throat> I could be wrong when I do that. It could be that one is the Texas War for Independence or some such nomenclature, and then everything that happens after that is technically the Mexican War or the Amer uh, Mexican-American War. So forgive me if you have the answer to that. Leave your comment in the section below. But anyway, this is not a novel about the entirety of either war or both wars. It is simply uh, a novel that takes place during the campaign that General Winfield Scott led, where he landed American troops in Veracruz, or very close to Veracruz, Mexico, and marched inland <coughs> to Mexico City and was eventually successful in defeating uh, Santa Ana and his, and his army. Uh, it is told from the perspective. It's kind of. It's it's one of those. It's not just like a dry historical recounting of events. It's. It, it, uh, there are certain liberties that the writer, that Jeff Shera takes, based on everything. Everything there is a record of being said, and based on uh, historical evaluations of the various characters. Uh, what if there's no clear indication of what was said at a particular time in a particular place between one person and another, then there's a certain amount of liberty taken with, you know, interpolating what was probably said. So, in other words, if, if, if two characters are having a conversation, it's probably not historically correct exactly, but it, but it, caps, it tries to capture the spirit of what was said, given what we know about, like, if it was two men two officers of the United States Army. <clears throat> and so the novel is told from the perspective of two men. Uh, one is General Woodfield Scott, who was the commander of this expedition. And the other uh, character, the main character, is Captain, then Captain Robert E. Lee. Uh, you know, the same one who led the Confederates, well, who was co first commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, and then finally Commander-in-Chief of all Confederate forces during the Civil War. <coughs> and it's, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really dwell on their relationship, but it, but it does show, I think, probably a big chunk of their interaction during that campaign. It wasn't a really long campaign. Uh, not to say that the Mexicans were really pushovers, it's just the Americans had much better artillery and better tactics, and so they were able to they were able to do what they wanted to do, uh, even though the losses were high. Uh, the American army started out with 10,000 troops, the Mexican army stand, started out with 30,000 troops. Uh, by the time the victory was, the military victory was achieved in uh, Mexico City, uh, the Americans had about 5,000 able-bodied men ready to fight. And, so, <clears throat> and I'm not sure how many of the Mexicans have, but I, they suffered pretty heavy losses. But anyway, it is told from the perspective of these two men, and so the, the chapters tend to alternate back and forth somewhat with some other characters uh, having their own uh, chapters such as... Uh, Lieutenant Jackson, who later became known as Stonewall Jackson, and uh, Pete Longstreet, who ended up being uh, Lee's second in command. Uh, you probably remember him from Gettysburg. <clears throat> he was the one who wanted to withdraw and get into a better position, fight a more defensive warfare, defensive war, and Lee overrode his wishes and sent Pickett's charge, right? If you know that part of your history, you know what happened after that. That was pretty much the high water mark of the Confederacy. But it, the book about the Mexican War is really interesting because it really shows how 
Hal Lee began, began he was an engineer. And so pre-war, pre the Mexican-American War, he was basically in charge of designing and building forts and then fixing forts that needed fixing. So he was, that's what he did. Oh, I just missed my exit. Darn it. Um, so that's what he was doing. But when he got down to, uh, and he, that was, that understanding was instrumental in the, in the, in the initial victory of Veracruz because Lee knew where to point the cannon to hit the walls at the right spot to make them quote unquote come tumbling down. And so, uh, that's exactly what he did. And so that was very, that's where he caught the attention of General Winfield Scott and Soon he was drafted more into a role of a scout, and there was a very good account of his first mission ever as a scout and how he nearly died. Uh, that was very interesting. Didn't, didn't know anything about that. And it just goes. To, it just goes. To, it's it's not sappy by any means. It's definitely. I mean, back then the military. Of course, I don't know what the military is like now. But, you know, it was like do do your job or, or get out. I mean, that was pretty much it. And, you know, Lee impressed his general a great deal. So by the end of the book, he was telling him he was one of the best officers he'd ever seen. And uh, Lee was a very... He was not brash at all. He was very reserved, uh, very self-deprecating, and not in a bad... Not like he didn't feel like he could... He, he knew what he needed to do. He did it, but he did not insist upon taking any glory unto himself or, or he, he, heaping upon himself any aggrandizement. He just he just felt like and his whole, you know, his belief in God, which was basically, you know, whatever God's will is going to happen. And so I'm, all I need to do is worry about doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And God is in charge of all the other stuff, including the outcome of whatever I'm doing. And, so, and Winfield Scott did not share that, that belief system, but he still still respected Lee a great deal and it was obvious that Lee respected Scott a great deal. And so, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of, <clears throat> it was, it was interesting because Scott, of course, Lee, you know, we show, the book shows him developing as a, as a, as a leader, as a tactician. You can see why he was so, you can see the beginnings of why, of the, of the learning curve that he was in that would lead to his fruition during the Civil War and, and why he was able to do the things that he was able to do against superior, the superior, uh, superiorly manned Union Army. But also Winfield Scott is a, is a good study because basically the only thing he'd done before the Mexican War was he had like one or two really good battles in the War of 1812. And of course the War of 1812 was 35 years in the past during the Mexican War. And so he had really not he really did not have any, he had military experience and he had tactical experience, but he didn't have any true field, ex, real field experience, not extensive fields experience. And so, you know, you can see how he grew as a commander, as a general, I'm looking for my turn. And that was really interesting. And, you know, he, he you know, it's like he, he was, he used to, you know, at the beginning of the book, he was rather naive, he, not naive, but full, kind of full of himself, really. You know, he thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and <clears throat> the first battle where the Americans suffered significant casualties, in fact, they, kept, they suffered 10% casualties, and he was like, oh, we won, we won, we won, it was so great, and then he looked at his men, and then he realized, he came to realize that that they were the ones, that they were what was important, to, to, to keep them, I mean, they had to do what they had to do, but he didn't want to get into a situation where he was just wasting people's lives, and that really made him a better, a much better, what well, made him a better man, and it made him a much better general. <clears throat> and so that was, so both men grew during the, during the course of the war, Lee a lot more, but then a lot of a lot of the things that Lee suggested from his duties as a scout were approved or were, were put into action by by Scott, and so it was. <clears throat> they had a close working relationship, even though it was kind of funny. You wouldn't expect probably a captain and, and the commanding general to have such a close relationship, but uh, Scott really did depend upon 
a lot of Lee's work uh, to get done what needed to be done. And so that was very interesting. So, you know, if you are, if you're into American history and you enjoy it and, and you know, like if you know at least the major events like the Revolutionary War, Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, I mean, if you know all the high points, then this is a good book. It kind of fills in a gap between the War of 1812 and the Civil War, and it shows it shows a lot of a lot of the people who later rose to prominence in the Civil War, especially on on the Confederate side, are there. Uh, but Grant is there too. But Grant is really the only northern, I think, really the only major northern figure, Union figure that's in that's in this book. Now I'm not, which is not to say that. Uh, Jeff Sharon might not have cherry-picked his characters a little bit, but I don't think he really did. I think he picked out the ones who did the most and, and highlighted them. Um, yeah, I think that's how he did it. I don't, I, I don't think he was too editorial about it. Alrighty, well, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below. If you'd like more details, ask them in the section below. Like and subscribe. We appreciate when you do. We'll see you on the next video.